Grace and peace to you in the name of God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in whose spirit we worship this morning. The Lord be with you. Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Zion Methodist Church of Gordonville. I am fortunate to be the pastor here. Scott Griffin is my name. Always a delight to be in worship with you and welcome you to worship. Whether you are worshiping with us in-house or online, we thank you for worshiping with us. You have an opportunity to check into Zion. If you're in-house, you have your welcome to worship card. You can fill that out. And a little bit later in the service when the offering comes by, you can drop that off giving us record of your attendance. If you're in-house or online, you can check in through the online application you're using. Uh, Just let us know you're here. We'd love to know who worships with us, especially if you're normally here but aren't able to be. It's good to know who checks in and and who we can see is still uh, part of worship with us, even though we didn't get to see you today and you saw us. It's good to know, so please do so. I have a few announcements as we begin our worship service this morning. In the bulletin, as you open it up, you'll find that welcome to worship card, but also a few things to go over. Every week we have communion, we receive an altar rail offering. That altar rail offering uh, has gone to the same place that our birthday gift for Jesus this year will go to, the uh, Veterans Home of Cape Girardeau. And the birthday gift for Jesus, for those of you on this side, you can't see it, but there's the silver present back here. And we're going to pass that around tomorrow night at our Christmas night service and and gather together a gift uh, on, on behalf of Jesus and offer it to the Veterans Home of Cape Girardeau. Christmas night service is tomorrow night. Makes sense. It's Christmas, 7 p.m. It'll be right here. Looking forward to the festivities and things that will happen. Um, Looking forward to your presence with us, as well as for those of you who'd like to stick around, there may going to be some food, uh, especially for those of you to bring finger foods. If you're going to show up, please please bring something to share. And uh, even if you can't uh, share, you know, maybe you're not good at sharing. No, if you didn't bring something, maybe you, you could still be welcome. Uh, but if there's something you're curious about and want to know what to bring, there's some numbers in the bulletin of a couple of folks who'd be happy to answer questions and help you bring what is best so that we can have uh, a good fellowship time for those who are interested uh, tomorrow night after the Christmas night service. An email went out, or actually a letter went out, from me to all of the confirmands. We should have a good size confirmation class coming up this year. And this is just to let all of Zion know that we're having a confirmation class start the first, first Sunday of January. And it'll run for 12 weeks in a row. And then, uh, and then we'll pause for one week to do Easter. And then the next week will be Confirmation Sunday. So we're going to begin that. I'll begin working with the 5th uh, and 6th graders in the bridge class. And then a few others uh, who come in to be, participate in this year's uh, confirmation group. That'll start uh, two Sundays from now. I just want to let all Zion know we've got something to look forward to. Some youngsters confirming their faith in the life of this church. Um, ten or more, possibly. We'll have to wait and see how many all sign up. And, and that reminds me, of all the letters I've sent out and said, please respond back to me, I've only had one response. But there's at least ten kids in that class. So anyway, I know there's going to be more responses. So this is a little, it's, what is it, like Christmas time or something for you all? Anyway, you'll get me your message, and I'm looking forward to teaching the class and the youngsters about our faith. That's upcoming. Our last worship service of the year, next Sunday, will feature a Wesleyan Covenant renewal service. All that really means is that the order of worship is going to be rearranged a bit to support that service. There's going to be some differences, but meaningful differences. I'm looking forward to doing that with you next week on New Year's Eve. And uh, that's about the last announcement I have, but I have another announcement for you that I'm not going to announce At this time, Lyle Johnston, one of our history committee personnel, will come forward and invite you into participating into some historical stories of the life of Zion. Good morning, church, and Merry Christmas. Uh, I'm part of the history committee here uh, with uh, Pam Johnson and Gene King and I. And we want to finish up the 175th, hopefully, with a history book that's got some personal stories that you might remember from the last 35 years, from 1989 to present. The reason why we're only doing 1989 is the 1988 book, history book, is took care of part of the past. We're looking at doing 1989 to 2003. And if you've got a particular story, it depends on whether it's a youth, uh, women's group, men's group, uh, part of a committee, we'd love to have it. Turn it into the church office. And if you're wondering uh, what you're looking for, uh, during uh, Joe Kidwell's term, he scheduled a hymn that nobody could sing. And we stood there and let him do the solo. 
And he says, well, I won't schedule that hymn again. And I piped up and said, you did a wonderful solo. So that story's going to land in the book. So this is what we're looking for, that type of thing. Turn it into the uh, Martha at the office. And uh, I can't remember the email address, just in case you want to write it down. And, uh, but uh, click Z, and it will tell you what the uh, email address is if you want to do that. Anyway, thank you very much, and we'd uh, look at having this thing put together by this spring. So, thank you. And again, Merry Christmas. That email address is office at ziongordonville.com in case you want to know what that is. You can find it at the bottom of the bulletin, people are telling me. I know what it is, so I don't know where to find it. So, but thank you. That's a good place. It's office at ziongordonville.com, especially for those of you who are worshiping online. If you've got a good history story, we thank you, Lyle and History Committee, for putting that together. As we begin worship this morning, we have a call to worship, which will be offered by our liturgist this morning, uh, Wayne Denicky. He's going to come forward. Would you stand with him and with me as we recite portions of Luke 1? This is portions of Mary's Magnificat. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl and, girl, and from now on all generations will call her blessed. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made his promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, Blessed Be the God of Israel. may be seated. For those of you who uh, may not remember, we are working through our time in Advent this year where we have Advent scriptures and Advent songs. I'll be speaking a little bit more to that in the, in the sermon this morning, but we're not singing Christmas music and it's just one day before Christmas. What gives? Well, I'll be talking a little bit more about that in the sermon, but that is a part of the plan. Sorry for those of you who are really looking forward to it. Best I can say is maybe next year. We'll just see. Uh, there will be Christmas music, of course, tomorrow night at our Christmas night service, but we're getting there, and there's a reason for all of that, as I said, that I'll allude to in the sermon. 
At this time, we do have an Advent reading, which during this time of the year, I've been using as our Old Testament lesson from the lectionary. And so that comes from 2 Samuel. Our liturgist is going to read this to us. And as he does, Miles Schmid will come forward and light our Advent candles. Um, all four candles will be lit this morning, uh, including the pink one, which has been saving for last because through the sermon series I'm doing, this represents the joy candle today. It's a little bit different than usual for those of you who know how this normally works. But anyway, that's what Miles will be, Miles will be lighting as uh, our liturgist comes forward to read us from 2 Samuel chapter 7. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Go ahead and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the Lord said to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all of your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth, and I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they have done in the past, starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. Let us respond with our Advent hymn, our Advent chorus, in his time. We uh, have decided to offer the special from the 8 o'clock service in uh, this service as well. Uh, that song sort of speaks to the Sepulvedos, um, what they're going to offer us today as uh, God does things in his time and, and may this offering that they bring be a beautiful thing. It, it has been a long time in developing for the whole family to be where they're at so that they can offer us this beautiful rendition and it includes a few moments even from heaven. So be listening carefully for when little heaven sings from the piano. We're excited about this. It was wonderful in the eight o'clock and I'm so glad you guys get to hear it here at the 10:30.
precious promise coming back again oh Messiah Messiah a baby born to save us all You, that was good stuff. Uh, good, good for us to have in both services. How would you miss it? How would you miss it? You can't miss it. You got to offer it, and they did. Thank you so much, Savalvados, and and Heaven, and the role that you played. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of the the body of Christ, and for all of your giftings to be offered. There's no better place in all the world to offer your gift that God has gifted you with, in God's kingdom. And we got to experience just a, a version of that with music. There's so many other roles to play in the life of the church. There's things that you can do that make a difference for His kingdom and help you to feel most content in all things. We get to hear another version of that with the choir, other voices, other ages, offering us their gift. Looking forward to the choir special this morning.
Thank you, choir. Wonderful job as well. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from the book of Romans, the, the end of the book of Romans, chapter 16. And these words will again be offered by our liturgist this morning, Wayne Denneke. Now all glory to God who is able to make you strong, just as my good news says. This message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan for you Gentiles, a plan kept secret from the beginning of time. But now, as the prophets foretold, and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere, so that they too might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. The next hymn is Tell Out My Soul, and as I looked at it for use today, I found the, uh, the hymn tune to be like one of those that uh, Lyle had talked about. The, the, hymn, the tune may be unsingable, I'm not sure that it is unsingable, but it may be, and we weren't as familiar to it. So I decided to put it with a, a hymn tune that may, you may be more familiar with, Abide With Me. So we'll sing Tell Out My Soul to the tune of Abide With Me, and this will lead us into a time of prayer. Almighty God, we are so grateful for the stories of Scripture that can be put to song. What an interesting way to say it. Tell out my soul. That is the same kind of language in the words of Mary from the Magnificat saying how God has blessed her from on high, how God has given her blessing and grace and is using her in his kingdom. And though she is used in a way that none of us will be, it feels so much the same, Lord, whenever you choose to use us. Whenever you let us know how, how we are participating in your kingdom, our soul rejoices in God, our Savior, for what you have done and what you do. Lord, I pray that we are a church that embodies that, that enacts that in the world, that shows the world you can use us to do your will. Despite who we are, what we've done, where we've come from, you are the kind of God that uh, doesn't concern yourself so much with what has happened, but what can happen. 
you choose to take us from where we are to where you want us to be, and we are so grateful. We celebrate this, this season of the church, a time when you had prepared the way for something magnificent to occur in the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for this season of the church, the Advent season, the Christmas season. We thank you for the stories of this time of year, the music of this time of year, and the understanding of joy that is before us. God, some of us are, are struggling, though, in aspects of our life. Uh, many of those struggles may be listed in our prayer bulletin. Some of those are held more privately. Maybe almost no one else knows. But we are so grateful, God, that you know the longings of our heart, the struggles of our mind. And I pray that each one would have the confidence to come to you in this moment and deliver those requests to the throne of your grace. Releasing them from our tendency to want to manipulate everything. It is actually in more control when it is in your control. Please give us patience and understanding, helping us to know the roles we should play, but help us more than that to allow you to work, allow your spirit to move. May we be a people dedicated to your purpose and your spirit, that when you move, we move with you. What a glorious time of year it is to pray that kind of prayer, to set ourselves aright in your will and in your kingdom and see what you're going to do next. For we desire to be a obedient people to the Lord. We desire to do as you would have us do. And so each week we come together, we have an opportunity to pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, if our ushers would prepare themselves, we'll gather together God's tithes and our offerings, an opportunity for us to give back in worship as a part of our worship, to give back only a portion of the wonderful blessings that God has given to us. I thank you for, so much for your kind and cheerful giving, and may God continue to bless you as you give. standing, we will hear our gospel lesson this morning, which comes from the end of Luke chapter 1. I hear this story offered again by Wayne Dinicky as our liturgist. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. 
Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear, in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will, re will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. The word of the Lord. You may be seated at this time, and if the children will come forward, it's been a few weeks since I've had a chance to do a children's sermon. I'll meet you down front. morning, kids. I uh, have some questions for you, questions that I think you'll know the answer to. What's tomorrow? Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, they got that one right. Okay, one for one. Uh, what's your favorite part about Christmas? Presents. Presents. Time spending time with family. Well, some, some good answers there. Yeah, that's what I got in the first service too. Presents and spending time with family. Glad to hear that. Do you know why? Do you know why we give? This is a yes or no question. Do you know why we give presents at Christmas? Boy, you're like taking it up a notch even. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there were people who brought presents to baby Jesus when he was born. But there's actually something that happened before that, that, uh, of course, all the adults are ready for. They already know the answer to this question, why we give gifts at Christmas, because Jesus came as a gift to all of us, that people, people were waiting for God to do something special in their life, because we struggle to do things right. You ever do things wrong? Ever have a hard time doing things right? Well, God gave us help in the person of Jesus Christ, and people didn't know exactly how God was going to do it, and Jesus became a gift from God himself to us to help us live a right life. And because God gave up himself, we often give of ourselves and give gifts to each other. Just like our congregation is going to give that silver box over there, it's going to fill it up with some, some funds and some help for the uh, veterans home of Cape Girardeau. We're going to give that birthday gift on behalf of Jesus. We're going to give that birthday gift from Zion to the veterans home. So we give of ourselves because God gave of himself. And that's why we give gifts to each other, even small ways, just to remind us that God did something incredible for us in the gift of Jesus Christ. And to remind you of that, I have a gift for you this morning. It happens to be a peppermint shaped spoon. So you can take this spoon and you can just eat it by itself if you want. Or you could stir it in your hot chocolate and have peppermint hot chocolate. You can do, it's your spoon. You'll just do whatever you want. And if you want to eat it in the church service, just be okay. Make sure it's okay with your parents. But I got these as a gift for you. You can choose a green bow or a white bow or a red, but it doesn't make any difference to me. One is for you. And some of you were here in the first service. You'll get two, but I'm not going to tell who that was. And I'll give you these to, these to you after we pray. So let's pray, and then you can have these gifts as you head back to sit with your parents. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the season of giving. Help us to learn how to give ourselves away the way you did. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, after a spoon, you can head back to your seats.
We got everybody, right? Well, all the kids anyway. I got to tell you, the green bows went the fastest. It was interesting to see. I had alluded earlier to the fact that things were different this year uh, in the service as we were singing a lot of Advent songs. Um, and for those of you who don't exactly know what that means, during the course of a, of a calendar year, a church year, you can use a lectionary, which prescribes to you what the readings will be each Sunday for the year. I don't do the lectionary all that often, honestly, um, but I decided to jump into it this year. But I rearranged it a little bit. Typically, there are four candles that you light, one candle each added uh, each Sunday for the four Sundays of Advent, the four Sundays before Christmas starts. And those words are represented on the wall, love, joy, peace, and hope. And uh, the joy candle is actually the pink one, supposed to be lit the third Sunday of Advent last week. But I rearranged those uh, because of the words on the wall are a part of the bridge of a song, which has been our Advent song this year. Uh, Christmas is coming, and the bridge says, prepare ye the way. We talked about that the first Sunday. And the second Sunday, for God's own baby boy. Last week, born to mend all broken things, which I talked more about peace. And today, he will heal the world with joy. That's how the song goes. So I rearranged the candles to go in that order. So just want to catch you up on some of that in case that none of that made any sense. That's how we're doing that this year. And as I've mentioned a few times over the last four weeks, we are at a really interesting time in the calendar of the church some of you may remember that I offered you a, a Happy New Year three Sundays ago, as the first Sunday in Advent is actually the beginning of the church calendar. It's not the new year based on how we do our calendars, but the church calendar begins the first Sunday of Advent. In that first sermon, I reminded us that despite the music in the world, the season of Christmas doesn't actually begin until tomorrow, Christmas Day. Now, the truth is, I have no trouble singing Christmas music during Advent either inside of or outside of the church and the worship services. I've just chosen to make it obvious here, this year, that there is a difference between the Advent and the Christmas seasons and the life of the church by singing Advent songs and only Advent songs during our worship. That was a choice just made for this year because of what the season of Advent offers, but that we don't always notice if we don't purpose to make it known. What that means, though, is that tomorrow night, the Christmas night service, is the first service at Zion in which it'll be full of Christmas music. And then next Sunday, too, New Year's Eve, it'll feature a Wesleyan Covenant renewal service. But again, it'll be full of Christmas music because in the church, we begin the season of Christmas tomorrow on Christmas Day. But it lasts until January 6th, or at least the Sunday nearest to January 6th. Now, saying all that and, and repeating parts of it again to you, I am reminded that this season of the year gets complicated for folks. Can we just call it Christmas? Well, it's the Advent season. For some, it's the Christmas season. Now, since we've passed December 21st, it's the winter season or the season of the winter solstice. But it's another season, too, something you may not know about. It's bowl season. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, bowl season is not where pastors, pastors gather each year as a team to join a bowling league and win the whole bowling alley to Jesus. No, that's not a bad idea. Bowl season is about college football. Any college football team with a mediocre or better record of wins and losses for their 2023 schedule has an opportunity to play one more game, some of them more than one more game, against an opponent that's assumed to be near the same caliber. Bowl season began a little over a week ago and has already featured a quite a bit of fun. This year, I have chosen to participate in something referred to as Bowl Mania. Through Bowl Mania, I chose to uh, pick the winners, see if I could get all the winners correct of the bowl games, and see if I could win prizes. There's no cost to it, so there's nothing to lose, and likely, at this point, nothing I'll win. It just tells you how good I am at picking bowl winners. However, it does make games that I'm otherwise not interested in at all a bit more intriguing. For example... A week ago tomorrow featured a game between Old Dominion against the university that my father-in-law went to work for straight out of college, Western Kentucky. These two schools faced off at the famous Toastery Bowl. To be clear, it's not that the Toastery Bowl is famous. It's that famous Toastery sponsored the bowl game. Anyway, like you, I had never heard of it before. But as it relates to me picking the teams to see if I might win something, and as I had never expected Old Dominion to be ever any good at football, combined with the fact that I share a love for Western Kentucky because not only is that where my father-in-law worked for his first job, but that is the place 
Bowling Green, Kentucky, where my wife was born. So I picked Western Kentucky to win. Having neglected to remember, though, anything about bowl season for several days after I made my picks, it wasn't until this game was nearly over that I had noticed other games had already been played and, and that this game was on currently. As I tuned in to see how things were going, Western Kentucky was in quite a bind. In case you can't see from the screen, I, I logged in about a minute before this time and tuned in to see that they were down a touchdown. And there's only 24 seconds left in the game. It's fourth and goal, meaning they've only got one more chance to score a touchdown. Even though there's 24 seconds left, this is their last opportunity. But they're on the 15-yard line, which is at least five more yards than they, away than they should be. Things aren't looking good. It looked nearly miraculous at this point that they would even tie the game. What I came to find out in the minute prior to this is that Western Kentucky at one point trailed 28 to nothing. They trailed 28 to 7 at halftime. But scoring three touchdowns in the fourth quarter brought them back to tie the game into, so they could go into overtime where a blocked field goal by their defense and a field goal of their own won them the famous Toastery Bowl victory. The elation on the field was contagious. A young quarterback, third string on the team, marshalling his teammates to an improbable victory brought tears to his eyes. Older team members were looking like grade schoolers, jumping around with bliss in groups. In the end, it's just a football game. What makes this such a happy experience, well, at least for those on the Western Kentucky side of the game? I gotta believe that most of the reason Western Kentucky is, is elated is that through the majority of the game, victory didn't seem likely. Devastation by disappointment and sadness was the most probable outcome. Yet, victory swooped in and stole the show. Some of the best games in any sport are the result of an improbable come-from-behind victory, a victory in which almost everyone had given up hope. And that's when hope turns to joy, and the most exuberant of joy. I was never more happy at the turning of an outcome of a game than when Texas came back to beat USC for the 2005 College Football National Championship. While Texas is not my favorite team, at the time, USC was my least favorite team, and they lost. <clears throat> Never was there more heartfelt joy from me, due to sports, though, when the St. Louis Cardinals came back to win the 2011 World Series, a team down to their last strike before they lose the whole thing twice in the same game, came back and won it all. Friends, we're not here to talk about sports, but it doesn't do these stories justice simply to consolidate the whole game or series into the worst than best moments in just one sentence. To remember precisely how the potential devastation developed where moments of hope were dashed, then later fulfilled, then still later answered unflinchingly with victory in each sports story. It's, it's well worth it. All of them, though, all of them put together don't hold a candle to the light of Christ born on Christmas Day which we celebrate tomorrow. As I think about the best sports stories during this bowl season, and because of some of the games this bowl season, I'm reminded of the sermon title offered by the fourth line of the bridge from our Advent song, Christmas is Coming. That line being, He will heal the world with joy. He will heal the world with joy. I think the most common response to this line would be, how? How does the birth of Jesus heal the world with joy. I mean, does joy heal anything? Antibiotics heal. Surgeries can heal. Shoot, rest heals. But joy? Well, I think it's a lot like these legendary sports stories. The particulars of how it improbably moved from devastation to victory is what produces so much joy. Just as the beginning of any sports event offers a sense of hope about the future, so does the backdrop of the season of Advent for the birth of Jesus. The season of Advent is like taking note of a scoreboard before the come-from-behind win takes place. By the end of Advent, the victory, though certain, hasn't yet begun giving us signs of its arrival. I think I read that wrong. 
By the end of Advent, the healing joy will happen. But it's the beginning of Advent. The beginning of Advent, though the victory is certain at that time, it hasn't begun beginning, beginning its signs of uh, arrival. We don't know at the beginning of Advent that really it's going to happen just around the corner. From our Advent and Old Testament reading this morning, we get an early glimpse of what the scoreboard read, what it will read at the end of the game. This is a promise that lays before them from 2 Samuel. God said, I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time and your throne will be secure forever. What a wonderful promise before them. This promise remains the hope of the Old Testament people of God for approximately a thousand years. A thousand years before Jesus is born. That's what the end scoreboard is going to look like. Secure forever. But before we get there, in that thousand years, if the lives of the people of God were to be tracked like a scoreboard in any ball game, it would reveal more times of losing than winning. By the time Jesus' birth arrives, God's people have split into two kingdoms. Good and bad leaders have come and gone. Both of those kingdoms have been ransacked by their enemies. Many of the people are exiled into new lands while some do return and the walls of Jerusalem get rebuilt, as does the temple for the worship of God. They remain the whole time oppressed by foreign powers and governments. The scoreboard doesn't look good. And that same scoreboard has reflected that the game has looked this way for a long, long time. Victory seems more like a torturous nightmare than hope of a dream come true. It is at this point many fans of any random sport would get up and leave the game early, fearing and figuring all hope is lost. But if the prophecies about the Messiah were to become true, well, that would change everything. Isaiah 9 says it this way, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For, those, for a child who is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. His rule, he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. This will come about. The prophecy of Isaiah 9 remains in front of the Old Testament people of God but the scoreboard, the scoreboard still doesn't look good. However, if this child, if this child from Isaiah 9 is being born, then, then the improbable, almost impossible, becomes not just possible, but likely. Because of the birth of the Messiah, now victory, no matter how far behind we started, victory seems more likely, even inevitable, because of who God has proven himself to be time and again. The joy in this circumstance is more exuberant because of the tumult that was endured to achieve it. That's true of the Old Testament people of God. As the New Testament people of God, sometimes we too come through rather devastating circumstances. We come through that by the power of the Spirit of God made known in the person of Jesus Christ. And we have been able to overcome our troubling times and our devastating circumstances in regard to doing that, Paul said it this way in Romans 8.37, No, despite all of these things, regardless of what it is that could cause trouble in your world, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Overwhelming victory. That gets close to describing the feelings I see on the fields of play when a team, one of those teams in which one would think all is lost, when that team comes back to win, and that's just a game. The feeling of overwhelming victory was captured in our gospel text this morning between Mary and Elizabeth and their words and, and from the words of Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah. First, though, we, we need to review what the scoreboard read just before the text of our readings this morning. To peek at that scoreboard, 
We go back to the beginning of the chapter, Luke 1, verse 7, which reminds us how things were going near the beginning of the game. Zechariah and Elizabeth had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive. And they were both very old. Their personal scoreboard is, is pretty devastating to them. Pretty devastating circumstance for them and how, what they were hoping for. But then, then a reason for hope develops just a few verses later in 11, 13, and 17. They say, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. The angel said, God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Soon after this occurred, reasons for folks to stick around for the end of the game are cultivated. By Zachariah's wife, Elizabeth, becoming pregnant and going into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. But it wasn't until the words from our call to worship this morning were uttered that the inevitability of the promise begins to become real. As Mary, pregnant with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, enters into the home to greet Elizabeth, their first meeting since both have become pregnant. Picking up at verse 41, the scripture says, At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, which is why we sung the song, Tell Out My Soul. Friends, this portion of the story, this is the touchdown to tie the game. This is when all the momentum has swung the other way. This means the opposition has to mount something they haven't mustered the whole game to prevent the inevitability of what is coming. That's when we hear, not that Jesus is born, but John. Zachariah and Elizabeth's baby, picking up at verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, everyone rejoiced with her. Then Zechariah gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, answering the call from 2 Samuel. Just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. About to, not yet, to give light to those who sit in darkness. Because the promised one who would prepare the way for the Lord John has been born, improbably born, fans of the Lord are led towards certainty about an overwhelming victory. And the Messiah hasn't even been born yet. Just like the score to tie the game leads to the momentum of overtime, and the faith of the team believing that a win in a win is at its peak. That's exactly how joy was made known leading up to the birth of Christ. All of that story, sounding amazing and being true. How does that heal? How does joy heal? Well, I don't have time left to get into all of it, but from today's scripture, what is proven is that because of who God is, and who God has been, we can anticipate his ultimate victory despite our pain in the moment. Overwhelming victory is ours. The scoreboard of our lives may reflect more of a loss in the making, but because of who God is and because of our willing connection to him, we are not limited to only what has brought us here. God is unlimited. And from his unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Indeed, just as Paul said, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who hasn't even been born until Luke chapter 2, and which we haven't read anything about in Advent. The joy of knowing who God is, from what God has done in the past, and has promised to do in our future, as our scriptures reminded us of this morning. To some degree, that knowledge of God, of what God has done in the past, to some degree, that knowledge leads to joy, which is healing. That joy heals. It provides strength and endurance and hope to keep playing the game, regardless of the scoreboard. The win is coming. We just aren't there yet. The win is coming. We just can't see it yet. We can't even see can't even imagine how God is going to bring it about this time. 
but we still can be certain. Certain because of who God is. And that assurance provides a balm for a time, a healing that comes from the joy of being in relationship to God through Christ. Christ Jesus, the baby whose birth seals the ultimate victory. As I mentioned earlier, the season of Advent is like taking note of the scoreboard before the come-from-behind wind takes place. The healing joy will happen, but the evidence of victory, though certain, hadn't been made known before. But now it has, through Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary, and now the birth of John. All these point to the fact, a fact that hasn't happened yet, but, but that still remains ever true. He will heal the world with joy. A joy that offers those suffering a balm of healing even now. As we conclude the service this morning, our band is coming together and, and more pieces are coming to be a part of it to lead us in our Advent song. I want us, as they get prepared, to stand and sing this song like our team just made a comeback victory for the ages. Are you with me? Some of you aren't with me. You're not, you're not in there with me. You're not like rah, rah. Get, I should have asked somebody to bring their pom-poms. We need, we need a little bit more. We need to sing with a joy like our team just made a comeback victory for the ages because truly that is what has happened in the birth of Christ and the lead up of Advent to the birth of Christ and what happens again every Christmas season until it happens to last for all eternity when the victory is all that there is. There is nothing left but victory and time with Jesus and time together. That is what is before us. That is what Advent portends for us in the life of Christmas. And it's what we're going to stand and sing about. As the band leads us, I encourage you to sing out. Tell out your soul. Christmas is coming. Let's stand and sing together.
overwhelming victory singing. Thank you so much. Hear this benediction, which is our epistle lesson. Now all glory to God who is able to make you strong, just as the good news says. This message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan for you, a plan kept secret from the beginning of time. But now, as the prophets foretold, and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all everywhere, so that everyone might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Continue to have a great Advent, everyone, and a Merry Christmas.